All right, cognitive behavioral theory. Let's just jump right in. So before we jump to the theory itself, a little bit of background to help us understand where it came from. Prior to cognitive behavioral theory, most of the counseling approaches were based on trying to understand and change a person's uh, personality, kind of at a deep level. This often meant going back and understanding their history, their early childhood, what took place to, to build their personality the way it was, and then what do we need to do inside of them to help them change their personality. And while this worked great for some, there was a, a growing movement that didn't like this and wanted to change that. So there was a, a rejection of this kind of intrapsychic focus and a focus that, that forced people to go back and look at their past. At the same time, society in general was kind of growing in its love affair with uh, the scientific method. And so people thought that if it can't be studied and validated through science, then we should just ignore it. So this led a group of uh, psychiatrists and psychologists, counselors, to want to move away from personality theory and instead use the empirically derived, scientifically supported learning theory as a basis for counseling. So before we talk about cognitive behavioral counseling itself, let's spend a minute to understand the learning theory that it's based on. And to do that, we need to start with our friend Ivan Pavlov here, who had what I like to call a digestive accident. And he was doing research on the digestive reflexes of dogs, mainly taking a look at their salivation, the production of saliva and other gastric juices. And he, his research was good enough and new enough and important enough at the time that in 1904, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology. So this is a smart guy who knows what he's doing. And when he was giving his acceptance speech for his Nobel Prize, he began talking about what he called conditioned reflexive responses. And this was something new. No one had ever heard of this before, but it ended up becoming what we remember Pavlov for. Let's take a look at his experiment so we can understand that a little better. So here's a diagram that shows what was going on with Pavlov and what he learned. We know that if you present food to a dog, they salivate. It's a natural reflex. Um, Pavlov called it an unconditioned response. We might say an unlearned response or just a natural reflex. Whereas if you just blow a whistle, they don't salivate. Obviously, there's, there's no connection. So then Pavlov would pair that neutral stimulus, the whistle, with presenting this food that has an automatic or a reflex response, and you'd still get that unconditioned or unlearned response because the food is there. But if you pair these two together enough, pretty soon the dog comes to associate the whistle with food, and so their body has this learned response. This becomes a conditioned stimulus, and a conditioned response or a learned response based on this pairing over here. So this process forms the foundation of what Pavlov called classical conditioning. It's the pairing of a natural with an unnatural stimulus. And over time, the unnatural stimulus ends up producing the same response, becomes a conditioned or a learned response. The idea here is that a stimulus will lead to a response. So that's classical conditioning. Well, there was research uh, going on as well into a different type of learning that became uh, really associated with B.F. Skinner, and it's called operant conditioning. And the main idea here is that what happens after we behave a certain way will powerfully influence whether we repeat that behavior or not in the future. And we can diagram this like this. So behavior will lead to certain consequences. Everything that we do will have a consequence. And it's how we feel about those consequences that will determine whether we are going to repeat that behavior or not. This is true for humans as well as for most animals. There's a couple of different ways we can look at the type of consequences and the way that they influence behavior. So a consequence that increases behavior is typically called a reinforcement. And any consequence that decreases behavior is called a punishment. And when we're applying consequences or creating consequences, we can either give something after a behavior is done, and we would call that then a positive uh, 
consequence, not positive because it's good or desirable, but positive just because we've added something to, to the environment. Or we can take something away as a consequence, and that would be a, a negative consequence. So for example, if my child is misbehaving and I decide that to change their behavior, I want to apply a consequence, I could give them a timeout. That would be a positive punishment because I want to decrease the misbehavior, but I have applied something, the timeout, to the system. Or if I want to, let's say I want to increase behavior, my child studies really well, and I want to increase that behavior, so I want to reinforce that, I can do it by taking away some of their chores. That would be a negative reinforcement. The main idea uh, that came out of all this research is that when we want behavior to repeat, the best way to do it is not to punish certain things, but to provide reinforcement kind of in a variable fashion, intermittently. That's the best way for uh, us to influence behavior. One final type of learning theory here that's important to understand, social learning. The idea being that we don't just behave or learn based on conditioned reflexes or on the consequences of our behavior, but that we can observe the world, and particularly other people, and learn based on just that observation. And Albert Bandura is most commonly associated with, with this approach to learning. So he really focused on the role of the environment. When we think about things like uh, cues in the environment that prompt us to behave certain ways, that can be part of it. But specifically, he focused on the people, uh, and he called them models. The idea being that we can watch other people doing things and learn to, to behave based on just that observation. His classical experiment was the Bobo doll, where he put some kids in a room uh, and had an adult in the room who was kind of playing violently with a Bobo doll. And those kids, after the adult left, would then go behave and do almost the same exact kinds of behavior. So they learned they weren't reinforced, they weren't told to go do anything, there was no conditioned stimulus, but just through that observation they learned to behave that way. Now we know that the, the impact of our observation goes way up when the models around us, when we perceive them to be attractive, not, not just in a physical sense, although that's important, but attractive as in desirable or they have other characteristics that we would desire. So when they're attractive, when they're similar to us in race, gender, age, other characteristics, and when we perceive them to, to be powerful. So if we were to observe a teacher or a police officer behaving a certain way, that would increase the likelihood of our behaving that way as well. So with Bandura's model, the idea is that, that behavior is influenced by personal factors as well as by environmental factors, but that those factors all kind of influence each other. This kind of is a nice summary of all of those different models, that personal characteristics could include our, our natural reflexes, that that's going to impact behavior and can be conditioned. Our environment, uh, not just those cues in the environment, but also the consequences of our behavior, that's going to influence behavior. And then the, the social models around us will influence our behavior. Okay, a quick summary then of behaviorism and how that applies to client problems. The main idea here is that behavior is caused by what comes before it, what comes after it, and the social context in which it takes place. So if that's what causes behavior, then if we want to change behavior, we're going to change the things that come before it, the things that come after it, and its social environment. Now there's one industry that's made a study of how do we do this and how do we perfect it. Millions have been spent. Those are the folks in Las Vegas where they manipulate what comes before, what comes after, and the social environment probably better than, than anyone else to get people to spend their money and to stay gambling. Okay, a couple of other important points about the behaviorists, and this carries over into the cognitive behavioral counseling as well. First is the notion of a functional assessment. The, the behaviorists are probably the best at doing a really careful, meticulous assessment of what's going on. So they get a lot of detail about this problematic behavior. So with the picture there, I'm, I'm using the example of drinking. If someone comes in and says they want to change their drinking, they would get an incredible amount of detail about that. They'd look at when does it occur, where, what's going on before it, what goes on after it, 
What's the, the context and the environment? When does it not take place? They'd get a lot of detail about all of that. And then they would ask the person to carefully track all of those things over a span of time. And sometimes just tracking that behavior will start to change the behavior itself. They'll look for things called secondary gain. What might be reinforcing this behavior that the client isn't really aware of, but that ends up producing that behavior over and over again? And then finally, you want to understand what is it that the client really finds rewarding, and how can we then use that to manipulate through reinforcement and punishment and help the client change their behavior. Behaviorists, probably more so than any approach we'll study this semester, really have a precise and focused way of doing goals. Goals are important in behaviorism and, and in cognitive behaviorism. So we'll spend some time in class tomorrow talking about how they do their goal setting. Behaviorists also tend to see the counselors as the experts on behavior. Clients are experts on their lives, but the counselors know best how to help clients change their behavior. As such, they tend to be a bit more directive in their approach, telling the clients, here's what you need to do, or here's how you can change that behavior. They tend to assign more homework than some other approaches. And in some cases, the treatment has even been uh, written down in a manual with step-by-step -step instructions, which works pretty good in research, but not so well in the real world where you don't have such a tightly controlled setting. A couple of ideas about the doing part of behaviorism or the treatment plan, the interventions. Some of these will, will sound kind of familiar to you. Shaping is the way you use uh, reinforcement to move a person step by step closer to a desired behavior. It's the way um, dolphins are trained to, to do all their tricks at SeaWorld. Token economies, the little chart there, uh, earning stickers or points for certain behaviors and then having those, those points or stickers applied towards a, a reward at the end of a, a time period. Aversion therapy is the application of some sort of a punishment after a behavior that makes that behavior aversive. Think of uh, taking antabuse, which makes people who drink terribly sick, uh, and that's a bad enough experience that hopefully over time they'll stop their drinking. Skills training, uh, pr providing kind of modeling or demonstration of specific skills that we want our clients to apply or, and use. And some of the group work, I think, applies to that as well. Getting uh, clients together with similar people, so models that they perceive to be similar to themselves who are working on similar things, can help them learn and change their behavior. Finally, a lot of role playing. If we want a certain behavior uh, to develop in our client, then we can role play that behavior and help them practice that in session. Okay, finally we can get to cognitive behavioral counseling. And the main idea behind this is the notion that in between stimulus and response, that model from behaviorism, something takes place in people's minds. They think about things. And so if we understand what goes on in their thinking, maybe that'll help us change their behavior. So it really builds on behaviorism. It doesn't reject any of that stuff. It pulls it with it and just adds in the role of thoughts in causing our, our problems, our concerns, as well as in solving them. So then the, the notion would be we need to identify and change problematic thinking as well as changing and modifying behavior. All right, let's quickly talk about three uh, distinct approaches to cognitive behavioral counseling. There's a lot of different approaches, but we're just going to focus on three, and they all have the same thing in common. They're really just trying to help people change their thoughts and change their behavior using all that stuff we've talked about before. So our first approach is the uh, REBT, which stands for Rational Emotive Behavioral Therapy. That's a model that was developed by Albert Ellis, and he focused on changing irrational beliefs. The idea is that uh, the, if we believe things that aren't logically true, that's what's causing us problems. So we should identify them, then dispute and challenge those thoughts. And one of the ways that uh, Ellis would help clients dispute them was with what he called shame attacking exercises. He would prescribe some homework that would attack the, uh, the irrational thinking and the shame that, the, that came from the irrational thinking. So his model is often called the ABCDEF model, and you saw this before, but just to review. So there's activating events, and then we have beliefs or irrational thoughts in our head about those events, and that's the irrational thinking that leads to the, the emotion or the behavior after it. 
So in the model, we want to dispute those irrational beliefs, and that will lead to a more effective way of thinking about the world, and consequently, new feelings and new behaviors. Ellis didn't have a whole lot of relational warmth. His way of being with clients was pretty stern, pretty uh, kind of a teacher, uh, someone who would challenge his clients. So another cognitive behavioral model is called uh, cognitive therapy. And this is the approach that uh, Beck developed. And he really is focusing, instead of on irrational beliefs, he's focusing on negative automatic thoughts. He believed that the way we perceive the world will determine how we feel about the world. A sim very similar to um, some of Adler's ideas. So he wants to explore what are the, the negative kind of knee-jerk automatic thoughts that we have about our experiences and how does those how do those automatic thoughts distort our our reality so he wouldn't confront the same way that Ellis would he would use a lot of Socratic questioning and that's the, the the idea of using questions to help the client arrive at their own conclusions rather than telling clients what they ought to think or feel or, or do he would use questions that would invite the client to consider things and arrive at their own conclusions he called this a collaborative empiricism. We're going to together, the client and I, are going to explore and uh, kind of apply the scientific method to challenge the, these thoughts. He saw that uh, a warm therapeutic relationship as central to his approach. All right, one final model of cognitive behavioral counseling called cognitive behavior modification. This is a model that was developed by Meikenbaum, which focuses on problematic self-talk the way we talk to ourselves and how that factors into our problems. Kind of three phases in his work. First phase, you let's figure out what is the self-talk that, that's going on in your head and what impact does it have. Secondly, we'll do some skill training and practice doing things, thinking things differently. And then finally, how do you apply it out in the real world? And then do you follow through when you get out in the real world? All right, let's wrap this up. It can be helpful to think about three dimensions in clients' lives. All clients have feelings, they all have behavior, and they all have thoughts. And meaningful client change is probably going to impact all three of these. If a client doesn't change all three, it's probably not a lasting or a meaningful change. But different models will emphasize different components, and uh, different clients will want to address components differently. So in this model, we see that, that behavior has a huge impact on emotion, but cognition as well impacts both behavior and emotion. In reality, they all influence one another. So way of thinking in this model. The main idea is that the things that come before, the things that come after behavior, the context of behavior, all of that stuff plays a role in influencing how we think and how we behave. And how we think and behave is what causes or leads to the concerns that bring clients into counseling. Therefore, if we want to change or help a client change, we better change some of the thinking, some of the behaving. Way of being. As I mentioned earlier, in uh, cognitive behavioral counseling, the counselor tends to take a bit more of an expert stance. Call that top-down, <clears throat> because uh, the counselor is going to be doing a bit more of the directing than in some of the other models. It doesn't mean that they don't try to collaborate or build a, an important uh, caring relationship but that they tend to be a bit more, we're the experts on behavior, let us tell you what you need to change and how to change it. As far as the doing and some of the techniques, uh, they incorporate a lot of the behavioral techniques as well as any others that will help to either challenge the, the way the client is thinking, recognize how those thoughts are impacting their behavior and their feelings, challenge the thinking, and then as well as uh, any technique that will help to manipulate the antecedents, the consequences, and the social environmental context of the behavior. And that's it, cognitive behavioral counseling.